Well, hello everybody, this is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to your Critique of the Week for Friday, December 11th. Thanks so much for joining us as always. I hope you're having a good week and a good weekend coming up. Now, as always, the uh, point of these critiques is to sit around, you know, a round table kind of thing, and uh, look at poems from the perspective of strangers and let the author know how you're reacting to the poem, what's working and what's not, that kind of thing. In the same way that um, the thing that I have always found most useful about an MFA program is that round table critique workshop that they do there. And this is a chance to let anybody uh, participate in that kind of thing uh, who might not have access to an MFA program, like I no longer do. And um, so please do leave your comments in the uh, chat windows, whether you're watching on YouTube or Facebook. Uh, those are the two primary places. I'll be watching Facebook the most, but I'll try to keep an eye on both. Um, if you're watching on Periscope or Twitter, I really am not watching. So, um, But, I mean, other people can see your, your comments there too. So wherever you're watching this, just leave comments and let the uh, author know what you uh, think about these poems. And I'll try to pass along as many comments as I can as we go. Um, but before we get into I should say, please do turn your phone sideways. If you're on a phone, click on full screen if you're on a desktop. And if you have the uh, bandwidth, click on the gear and make, uh, make it HD so you can see the poem as clearly as you can. And that kind of helps the whole process, too. So, um, and hello to Sally Dunn over there on YouTube. Let's see who else we got. Catherine Swanson's here. James Cicillo. Sean Hines. Good evening to you as well. Okay. Now, today's uh, poet is... Ilma Kureshi. And let's jump into this poem here. This is Rose in Wilderness. The starless sky is spreading to spaces that lie beyond the universe. At the end of the day, it is you and words versus spilling out of flowers. Speak to me in roses, she said. Roses let out only sighs, speaking to me in wilderness, snatch me from my existence, winter through my soul. Leave me bare like autumn trees, ripped off of leaves, of flowers, of all things that can be lost. That is today's first poem. We usually do two. And, um, here, so let's start with the title. Rose in Wilderness. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting. I mean, it, it paints a little bit of a picture. You can sort of imagine, you, you sort of get the, the first hints of the scene with the, uh, with the title. So it works. The lack of, um, like instead of rose in the wilderness, it just says rose in wilderness. It's an interesting choice. Uh, I maybe would, would include the article there. Um, the starless sky is spreading to spaces that lie beyond the universe. That's kind of, it's an interesting line. I'm not sure um, how to take it, though. I mean, it's not really a possible... Um, you know, not, not literally possible because there's nothing, um, you know, the, the, the starless sky spreading to spaces that lie beyond the universe. It, like, it's hard to imagine what specifically that's saying. It's hard to sort of wrap my head around that. But maybe, maybe I'm the only one. At the end of the day, it is you and words versus spilling out of flowers. So here we get this, this move to flowers is interesting because that was, it's unexpected when you, um, at the end of the day, it is you and words versus spilling out of flowers. And, and the flowers is not what you expect, so at least you get a little surprise there. Speak to me in roses, she said. And this is my favorite line in the poem. I like that a lot. And, and can you feel that? I, every time there's like some, it feels like poems have a heart where they're sort of speaking honestly for a moment, you know, in, 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 a, in surprising ways that the, the deeper consciousness can speak or something. And, um, and they always stand out. A lot of times they're really simple phrases or simple, you know, where it clicks, where, um, you know, you're sort of straddling the border between order and chaos or where you're um, in the flow or something as a writer. And, and, and this is um, what works the best for me. Speak to me in roses, she said. I love that concept. Speak to me in roses, she said. And the she, too, makes it more interesting. That's an addition. We don't know there, there's, um, we don't know who's here. We don't really, we have a you. In words, but that's sort of vague. Once we get a she, though, who says this, we sort of get a clear character, too, for the first time. So um, so this line really works. And I'm just trying to point out, like, the reasons why. Um, Roses let out only sighs. Speak to me in wilderness. And see, I wouldn't repeat this here. Because, because this was such a great poem, 
I mean, a great line, speak to me in roses, she said. I wouldn't repeat the speak to me in. You know, it kind of takes away the power of um, its earlier instance. Roses let out only sighs. I like the roses only let out sighs. Speak to me in wilderness, snatch me from my existence, winter through my soul. Snatch me from my existence, winter through my soul. And soul is one of those words um, that just has so much historical weight, I guess you could say, that it, it's almost a cliche in itself to use soul in a poem. And um, it, it ends up being melodramatic, I guess. And so that's one of the, the kind of things I would avoid. And I, and, um, I'm going to read that, avoid that. And it's because it feels like, to me, that when you get to, to things like this, where something's happening in my soul, and, or, and then leaving me bare, too, is a very similar thing. Um, it feels like you're sort of pushing an emotion. And anytime you're pushing an emotion, it, it loses the um, suspension of disbelief that the, uh, the reader has. Like, you remember, if, if, the, if the speaker of the poem starts, like, pushing an emotion and trying to make you feel stuff and being, like, dramatic... Um, then you remember, it, you know, it reminds that you're reading a poem and that you're tr that someone's trying to have an effect on you through this poem, and it, it sort of breaks the, the fourth wall or whatever and, and takes you out of the poem. And so, um, so these lines I would probably cut or change. Um, like autumn trees ripped off of leaves of flowers of all things that can be lost. So... So really, my, um, my main critique of this poem, my main suggestion for this poem, is to focus on the speak to me in roses, she said. That's such a great line. That feels like it could be the first line of a poem. Um, it could just be the beginning. And then sort of leap from there into wherever the imagination takes you. Um, you know, speak to me in roses, she said, blah, 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 blah. You know, like keep pushing that sort of voice and thought because that's really what's hitting home um the other the other parts aren't really connecting as much because they're really common images and um and i don't know it, it's hard to sort of feel connected to them because the she the she only appears here roses let out only sigh speak to me in, in wilderness that's an interesting line even though i i mean you could do speak you could make the speak to me i know i said before it takes away the power. But if you made the whole poem in this kind of ref like setup, like the speak to me was where refrains, they're repeated throughout. You could do this a lot. You could do speak to me in roses, she said, speak to me in wilderness and blah, blah, blah. And like continue the poem that way using like tapping into that energy. Like what, I, what I'm really trying to say is that there's an energy here that needs to be tapped into in these two lines. And, and you can feel it like in your bones when you get to these two lines. And, and the, the goal of the poet is to tap into that and like push it as far as it can go. And so if you started the poem, speak to me in roses, she said, speak to me in wilderness. And then you started to tell a story and, and like reveal who the she is and, and, and who the you are. Um, and that, that's the way to make the poem um, really work. And it's really always interesting to see, like it's sort of, poems very often do this. They sort of spin their wheels around and then something kind of connects. And if you can like feel that connection, and I think that's what really, I was just, um, who is it on the Rattlecast? We were talking about this with somebody recently where you kind of like, you're kind of listening to yourself for what connects and what has that resonance and where sort of the wheels that are spinning kind of grip and take off. And that's where these lines are. So the main thing, the main takeaway from this poem is to learn how to listen for what works in this way and then, and then key in on that after the fact. So I think this is a very um, early stages of something interesting is, is how I would put this poem um, but let me try to sort of untangle what's actually trying to be said here. Let's see. Roses let out only sighs. Speak to me in wilderness. Snatch me from my existence. Winter through my soul. Leave me bare like autumn trees ripped off of leaves of flowers of all things that can be lost. I do like this last line, I should say. Um, there's a... There's actually... When talking about, like, the energy of certain lines... There's, the, there's a lot of energy in this line. And this is a good, the, just the way the rhythm works of flowers, of leaves, of all things that can be lost. Like there's the, 
there's sort of like a landing of that energy here that works really well. So it makes a good last line, I would say. Um, but what does this mean? I'm trying to sort of decipher this, just so maybe I can offer some more advice. Roses let out only sighs. So, so the she, and I don't know, is, the, is it still the she who's speaking these lines too? Or is this back to the original speaker? That's something else that's unclear in this poem. Um, just because of the lack of punctuation and things like that. You can't tell if speak to me in roses she said is the end of what she says. Or, um, or, or, or is this a continuation of it down here? Roses let out only sighs. Speak to me in wilderness. It seems like maybe since it's the same pattern. So, so maybe if, I mean, if you were to keep this without, you know, using this as a starting point, I would maybe cut this um, stanza break here so that we can sort of don't have to be confused about who's speaking at this point. Although I do think it's the same she. So she's saying, um, let's see, starless sky spreading out. At the end of the day, it is you in words and verses spilling out of flowers. So then she says, speak to me in roses. Roses let out. Only sighs, speak to me in wilderness, snatch me from my existence, winter through my soul. See, I'm, I'm just not even following really what is being said with this last stanza. Let me, let me see what the comments are, and maybe, um, maybe the audience can help me out here. Yeah, Catherine Swan said already, speak to me in roses. So see, so if you, if you, you know, read a lot of poetry and you're doing these critiques, this week especially, you can feel these lines, too, that, that resonate in your bones. I think she probably said that before I even pointed it out. So that was Catherine Swanson who said that. Michelle Pfeiffer said powerful ending. Or, I'm sorry, there's another Michelle Pfeiffer. Um, Michelle Fulton Pfeiffer said powerful ending. Um, that could be a poem in and of itself. Yeah. Yeah, the, end, the very end is really good. I really, I'd say these last three lines. And it's that repetition, repetition, boom. You know, like the the bop bop boom that that makes it work, and and it's with the the rhythm of the music of the the way the language is moving of leaves of flowers, because these are quick quick, and then and then the rest of it of all the things that can of all things that can be lost. There's a there's a nice there's a I don't know it feels good to read that ending. So I think the ending is good. Um, Sharon Ferrante says roses let out only sighs could be first stanza. Where's the roses? Roses let out only sighs. Speak to me in wilderness. There's just something that's very abstract and distant and sort of guarded uh, with this poem. There's too much opacity. Like we just don't know a lot about what's going on. Like it's speaking so much in metaphor that the actual, um, you know, the, the reality behind it is something that we're trying to parse out instead of just... You know, the the details of, like, the who and the what um, aren't where the, the power of the poem lies. And and so, it, like, having to sort of try to figure out who's saying what to who and, and what, you know, who the she and who the you are, like, that's a waste of our sort of mental and emotional energy trying to piece that together and sort of trying to figure out what this stanza is actually saying. Um, where you want that stuff, those details to be clear, and then you want the leap that those do into emotion to be where the sort of ambiguities and complexities are in the poem. And, and that's kind of the, what's missing here. Um, um, Lisa Ellison says, lovely poem, especially speak to me in roses, she says too. I would avoid using at the end of the day cliche. There's, there are several kind of cliches here. Um, Debbie Wing, you could just say bear like autumn leaves. That'd be nice. Um, Lisa Elson also says the flower wilderness season images are great. I think referring to stars, starless is one too many images. That could be. Like, there's sort of a scene. The problem to me with this this image is that I couldn't really see it. Like it's sort of a, it's a starless sky is spreading to spaces that lie beyond the universe. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble um, just picturing that. It, it's just sort of like picturing n emptiness or something. Um, but, but emptiness spreading, it's a weird um, thing to try to picture. So it doesn't really set the scene in the way other images do. Um, 
speak to me in this is Deb Ewing says speak to me in wilderness would be better as the beginning of a stanza if if as if responding to Rose Girl. Hmm. So is she are you saying this is Rose Girl? The she? Speak to me in roses. Um Yeah, see I can't tell. I still like I I, I look at this and, and sometimes I think that this is the same person speak and then sometimes I think this is a, a response to this line. And I'm just not sure which is which. It's just unclear. And it, it's hard when you can't um you can't like suss out those details. It's hard to connect to the poem. Um So Debbie Ewing says, so I have a question, um, who the you are, how definitive are you expecting that identification to be? So, so I said, like, the, if we don't know who the you is, it's tough to connect to the poem, right? And I don't mean that we have to know, like, this is a specific person, just that how many people are here in the poem um, and sort of what their relationship is, um, you know, like... Because what you need, like, you have these sort of points, and you need to know how they relate to each other to connect the dots. And um, so, they, so um, you know, they they can be very vague as people. Um, they don't need, but the problem is, there's just nowhere to place this, you know. Um, so, like, if you, and I'm trying to think of an example of how it would work, but. But there's a you and a she here, and, and it's hard to know, is the you the she? Like, is that the same? It is you. Like, who's speaking to who? Does that, I don't know. It's hard for me to articulate this right now, but, like, when I get to this, um, at the end of the day, it is you, the words versus spilling out of flowers. Like, I don't know if the you is the person that the poem is being written to. Am I the you? Is the you the she? Um, and this is like a response to the you? Like just that that way that this, the people in this poem or the entities or something are interacting isn't clear like how they fit together. Um, and then in, you're trying to sort of make sense of that as you read. Um, whereas if you knew, um, like you, and just into the title, if it said letter to she, like if that was just titled, not a great title, but pretend it was just letter to she, right? Um, then you could imagine that the speaker is talking to the she because it's a letter to she, and then you wouldn't have to piece together that relationship of, of what's actually going on sort of within the speech of the poem. I hope that makes sense. Um, let's see. Sharon French says it seems to be about loss. Yeah, there's some, there's some sense of loss here. Uh, you know, with the um, the leaves left bare, and, and maybe sort of a, um, like a heartbreak kind of thing going on. But then, is a she the person who's left um, with a loss of all? You know, or is it the me? I don't know. It's hard to untangle. Um, but the images are interesting. Let's see. Um. So Jeff Littlejohn suggests core, perhaps, instead of soul. Yeah, that's a better word. Just because soul is overused, it, it just, like a lot of things, like, you know, love and things like that. Um, the, you know, if it's something that's been written a thousand times, then it doesn't have, it doesn't, like, stimulate your brain when you when you see it. Um, and Sharon French says, yes, it is vague. Dig into it. Um, Mandy Wallace says, so tough to balance metaphor and clarity. Some spark in the lines in this poem, though. Yeah, I love I love the "Speak to Me in Roses" line. I think that's just wonderful. Um, but really, the there's a sense of um, you know the 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 idea that clarity and metaphor are um, two different things. Um, like you can't have too much metaphor if you're going to be clear in a poem. I don't think that's really the case. Like once once you sort of establish the situation that's going on, then you can sort of, then we'll be able to leap with you as far as like the metaphor can take us. That's the thing. Um, but if we're lost, we can never sort of go there with uh, with you. Let's see. So let me see. I got to look over on, uh, let's see what's going on on YouTube. 
Um, Caitlin Buxbaum over here says ripped off should be stripped, I think. Um, where was the ripped off? Oh, yeah, ripped off. Autumn leaves ripped off. Yeah, stripped is probably a better verb there. Um, I love the first stanza is necessarily done. I feel it even if I don't understand to working of it. The second stanza is unclear. Yeah, the, the, the first stanza, it's hard to picture, but it's it's spoken in a direct way. And we sort of don't, that's before we start to lose track of the the relationship and who's speaking. We kind of, like once you encounter a poem, you imagine someone's sort of, there's a speaker speaking it. And sort of that's enough at first. And you're sort of not lost with the first lines. And so it's sort of easy to, even though this is abstract, you can see how that's easy to, um, you know, it's easy to, to stay engaged at this point until you start to sort of wonder the relationship and who the you is and who the she is and things like that. Um, so Sarah Krausen over on YouTube says, I start wondering about the what and why of the rose metaphor and how the metaphor is going to be pushed, might be pushed further in the poem. It's a good comment, yeah. Um, and right beyond the end of the poem, says Caitlin Buxbaum. And yeah, that's the kind of thing that, like, yeah. Yeah, just just dig deeper. Um, let's see. Oh, and Ilma Kureshi is here. Yeah, this is wonderful. She says, I wonder if I should weigh in. Yeah, you, let's see. So Ilma is here, and she says, the theme is impermanence, roses wither and die. Um, it's a search for the part of the soul that remains. So stripping the self off of all that can be lost. And yeah, that's a very, it's an interesting idea, but it's so abstract um, that, I don't know, like you need to find sort of, if, if something's abstract and you want to like explore the theme of impermanence and do something that abstractly, it still needs a sort of concrete container um, or else it's, re it's really hard to think of a poem that works in the abstract like that without... Um, and, and this is something we talk about in these critiques all the time, is that we as human beings are visual creatures. Our visual cortex is much larger than any other animal. It's the way we think. Um, you know, the, like thought itself is a, an imagining into the future of, of our visual cortex. And so, like, images really sort of construct all of our meaning. And it's hard to, like, think of poems and... Um, and just just don't work without working on like an imagistic level. And so if you're exploring something in the abstract, like the theme of impermanence, still putting in characters that we can sort of touch and see um, makes it it's sort of a necess necessity. It's really hard to do without doing that. Um, let's see. And then Caitlin Buxton says, then the question becomes, why is part of a soul missing? And whose soul? Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. I'm trying. There's a lot of comments over here. Thanks for everybody who's uh, chatting on on YouTube. And Caitlin Buxbaum, uh, just trying to pass these comments along so they're they're permanently in the video here too. Um, she says it might also be helpful to write toward or through experience rather than a theme. The theme should be clear from the event experience of the speaker of the poem rather than the poem just being. So that's something I was trying to say. Maybe that's a clear way to say it. That still, even if you explore, like, like I mean, just imagine um, like Dostoevsky or something. You know, in that novel, he's exploring um, moral themes and, and sort of problems like that. Uh, but it's done through character. and um, and And that's sort of how it has to work like there has to be even if it's not human characters or even if it's sort of personification or like just a still life like our theme our theme for uh the rattlecast coming up is a still life there's still like this this scene that you're painting and then the scene is what explores the themes and if you explore the themes without setting that up really well it's really hard to connect and sort of make meaning out of it i hope i hope i'm making sense um let's see um, um, so Ilma, Ilma here too, the author says, I guess I was drawing it from Persian poetics where it all has all those meanings, but for an American reader, I'm thinking how to, the overt meaning might seem romantic. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I, 
I didn't really feel like a sense of romance, but I but I did feel like it was sort of about a relationship, like maybe um, because there is the she and the you, you know, and I think that there's it seems like there's some relationship there. Let's see. Um, so so um, she's talking about in Urdu and Persian poetics, not having a clear sense of identity is what often makes poems tick. And the whole fun is trying to figure out who might be talked about. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. There are differences between between um, poetics in different places. Um, but there is a universal element, too, because to, our brains are all built the same way. Um, let's see. Well, let's look. Let me pop over to Facebook again. Let's see. So Debbie Ewing says, I think we all agree that a poem needs a purpose, but I don't know that it always needs to be a story. That's an interesting question, because, I mean, when you say story, um, you think of narrative usually, like as if there's like a beginning and an end and characters that are doing something. And that's not really what I mean by story. Like there's like a situation. There's like a landscape. There's a world. Um, and... If you don't have, like, it could be sort of a barren landscape. Um, like, think about, like, the um, the snowman or something. I mean, there's no person there, that, um, that poem by Wallace Stevens, right? There's no person there. There's just this barren landscape. But you sort of, it still has a story because it's a, it's a fixed, like, it's a landscape that you can enter sort of in your imagination. And it has, like, an existence, you know, that's what I mean. Like, there's a there's a story about the landscape in that poem. And and it's hard to imagine a poem that works without that. Like, it, it's just images. I mean, there are um, the whole language school of poetry from the from the 80s and, and, you know, Gertrude Stein and things like that try to do that. And it's something you can play with directly. But um, but that's like playing with language itself and, and the way um, the way things work together. So I don't know if that if that's the same thing. Let's see. Well, let's just look at the uh, the next poem. They're both short, and I've sort of been rambling a lot, so so we'll see what this is, and we'll sort of think of this through the same lens, you know. That that um, anyway, the beauty and terror. His lips were curled like daisies turned to the sun, pomegranate seeds flushed with blood bristling to life, butterflies leave spring fields and stroke a rose, the wind a witness to tremor. Beauty, softly caressing terror. So, um, so for this poem, it actually is a good example of what I was trying and probably doing poorly um, to articulate. Um, sorry, my foot was falling asleep. Um, so his lips were curled like daisies turned to the sun. Like that is not um, something that you would call like a narrative story, but there is still this um, this situation here which has sort of a, oh, God, how to, how to explain it? Like, a, it has a sort of past and future implied. It has, like, an existence, if that makes sense. Like, the lips are curled. And that's a great image, too. His lips were curled like daisies turned to the sun. I love that. That is a great opening and a great stanza. And I would say that this has a story, you know? I mean, just like um, the famous shortest story ever, the Ernest Hemingway um, um what is it? Baby shoes for sale, unworn? Is that how it goes? Um, it's just a few words, but but those little few words and one little image tells a whole story, and um, or at least has a story. It doesn't might not tell it, but it's a sliver of a story, the story of a moment, you know. And so this is a moment that is a story, if I, if that makes sense. It, it might just be the way I'm talking about it that that's confusing, but um, but th there's a presence here in this line, and it really works. Pomegranate seeds flushed with blood, bristling to life. So this is, again, I think that works really well, too. That's a good one. I mean, there's a sort of a haiku feel to this, like a f sort of fragmented, maybe a gazalish kind of, um, you know, each section, each stanza living on its own. Butterflies leave spring fields and stroke a rose. Butterflies leave spring fields and stroke a rose. Um, I think that works, too. Um 
The wind, a witness to tremor. Beauty, softly caressing terror. So the only, and I like this too. So I like everything. The only thing is, I don't think the ending sings in the same way. Um, the wind, a witness to tremor. Beauty, softly caressing terror. I think this is too direct. I think that might be, be the issue with this. Because with these, um, with each of the other ones, um, the, the, the feeling is told without telling. You know, it's the show don't tell thing. And at the end, we get the, um, the wind, a witness to tremor, beauty softly caressing terror. Like this is like an explanation of the other lines. I think maybe this could work um, if you just cut it off somewhere and ignore the end. Um, the wind, a witness to tremor. Hmm. Let's see. Butterflies leave spring fields and stroke a rose. The wind, a witness to tremor. Beauty softly caressing terror. Hmm. I'm trying to think of um, what I would do with the end. Um, I don't know. There's some. There's there's some way that. It doesn't let the reader sort of make the leap, you know, on their own. Um, and so so the trick is to find a way that sort of guides the reader to this destination without saying it directly so that we can participate. Um, the wind, maybe just, you know, I think it'd be a cool ending, just the wind to witness and then ending it there. I think that'd be a really a pretty cool ending. Um, yeah. Let's see. Um, so debuting says still life. Oh, no, never mind. Um, let's see. So Sharon Friendy says that would be a great haiku. That first stanza, I like that. Yeah, the first stanza is great. This is as good as that wonderful line about the speak to me in roses, she said. Um, I, I, I love that. And that could be a poem on its own, too. Um, oh, I kind of skipped over. James Tassilla says, I love the images. The title doesn't resonate with me. Agree that the end is saying what has already been said. Yeah, I forgot. kind of forgot about the title. Beauty and Terror. Yeah, the title has the same problem as sort of the ending, which is just it's too direct and sort of telling what to take from the poem instead of letting. Um, let's see. I'm trying to th wonder. I'm trying to think of if, if this ending could become the title somehow. Like if you if you sort of could combine these words. Um, I'm not sure how though into something that's like vague, so you wouldn't know what to expect, and then that could be sort of in the title. But I'm not sure how to do that with just those words. So I guess that that's not a good idea. Tremor caressing beauty, Jeff Little John says. Mark A. Grinier says the idea of terror comes out of nowhere in the second poem. I think. The curled lips, lips set up the possibility, but the middle of the poem doesn't carry it out. This poem is closer to done than the first. Yeah, the other thing I was wondering, I, I kind of missed over this too, which might help um, what, what Mark A. Grenier is saying, that the, the sense of terror or, um, or tremor, if you want to call it that, um, is present here, but sort of leaves. If you just left this out... Because the stroke of rose is sort of not, there's nothing terrifying hidden in that. But it, but butterflies leave spring fields. Of course, where are they leaving? Um, you know, to mate and die, I guess, is what butterflies do, right? And so so that would leave that sense of um, of terror as a possibility in this line. And then you could get the wind to witness. I think that would actually work. If you just cut out these sort of these lines and then the end here. Um, and if you just had it, the short with a better title, um, I'm not sure what I have to think about the title, but if the poem was just his lips were curled like daisies turned to the sun, pomegranate seeds flushed with blood burst bristling to life, butterflies leave spring fields, the wind a witness. I think that sort of contains it all without having to explain it. And I think that's really what, um, what would work. So that, that would be my suggestion. I think it's like a, a pretty good poem. If it, The only other thing maybe, so I, I'd want a better title because this is sort of too leading. Um, and I would also, um, maybe the, this line here, pomegranate seeds flush with blood, 
the bristling to life is sort of the same problem as the stroke of rose. Um, how are we going to see it's flush with blood? I'm trying to think of how that, you could rephrase that. Um, and maybe pomegranate seeds bristling with blood would be a, a better a better way to do that. Um, I don't know. That that's something. That, this is the only. I think I would just play with these lines and come up with a better title and cut that end. And I think that's a good poem. Um, so that's that'd be my opinion about that. Let me look over. I, I it's hard to flip between screens. Let me look over YouTube. <clears throat> um. Let's see. Let me scroll up and try to find where I left off last time. A lot of great discussion. So if you're on Facebook, hop over to YouTube, and, and the um, the actual poet is here, and there's sort of a good discussion between her and Caitlin Buxbaum and uh, Sarah Krausen. Um, let's see. Um... Let's see. Um, Elma imagines something interesting. That gazelles in English seem a bit too forced sometimes due to having retained refrain, refrains and meter. Um, let's see. Anyway, so there's just some um, interesting discussion, but not really about the poems. Let's see. Um... Yeah, it's an interesting discussion, but I, I don't know if there's anything really to add going on on YouTube. But but it's neat to hear from um, from the poet too. Oh, pomegranate seeds, cool title. That's a good suggestion. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I think we are done here. I think this is um this is a very good close poem. I, I think this is close to being done. Um, the other one still to me feels um like it's sort of got something really cool. But this is the poem that needs to to become a new poem. I think that would be, um, you know, I would start with this and, and maybe get that speak to me in wilderness and let that become the energy moving down the page for the other poem. So those are my two, uh, my opinions for these. Um, and thanks everybody who participated in this critique of the week. It's always a lot of fun. Um, and thanks to uh, Ilma Kureshi for, for being here and um, sharing these poems with us, which are um, really wonderful images in a lot of these and um, some really great lines. So um, great to see that. Uh, thanks for participating. Now, um, on the, let's see, upcoming, we have the open mic show, of course, I should say, Sunday at noon Eastern time, 9 a.m. Pacific. We'll be doing, um, as always, an open mic for poems about current events. We'll go for maybe an hour, maybe half an hour, something like that, as long as people want to share poems. And then next week's guest on the Rattlecast is going to be Sarah P. Strong and her newest book, The Mouth of Earth. Uh, Sarah P. Strong, a poet we've published very frequently, and is just a wonderful poet. I haven't met her before, but I'm um, looking forward to it soon. And uh, the prompt for this week is... Uh, let me see. I, always, I should pull this up ahead of time. The prompt for this week is going to be... Oh, yeah. Oh, that's kind of... Wow. What are the odds? A still life is a work of art depicting mostly inanimate and typically commonplace objects. Write a still life poem. And we were kind of talking about still life poems in this in this um, critique, so that's perfect. Um, so write a still life poem, and we'll see a bunch of examples um, on Tuesday night at the open mic. Uh, and we can also... We're still expanding it to... You can share whatever you'd like to share as well. So uh, feel free to share a poem on Tuesday night after we talk to Sarah P. Strong in their book, The Mouth of Earth. See you then. Hope you have a great weekend. Goodbye.